So as Peter said, this is the title um, of my um, PhD dissertation, which looked at uh, specifically um, the production of handicrafts and artwork within uh, the prison experience of the UVF and the Red Hand Commandos. They were aligned together within the prisons um, under uh, effectively UVF leadership. Um, but especially uh, looking at how the prisoners saw themselves um, politically in a group setting as a paramilitary prisoner, but also individually uh, and the ways that they expressed those varying identities through making these objects and engaging with these objects. Um, but specifically within, uh, as my title alludes, compounding identities within the compounds of the Maze Long Cash Prison. So if anybody is not aware uh, of that distinction, I'll, I'll start off with just kind of outlining um, what that prison structure looked like. Uh, so uh, several theories relating to artifact production and identity formation, um, the changing meaning of objects over time and in different spaces uh, was very relevant for my research. Um, and what I have today, I'm just going to read a section from one of my chapters, um, which, uh, interestingly enough, Peter, when you chose the, the picture for the seminar, you chose a, a public mural. I'm going to be talking about um, compound murals, prison murals, and why they're different from the more overtly violent mural that you selected. So when you, when you selected that, I was like, oh, nice job, Peter. <laughs> you didn't even know, but good job. Um, so particularly today, focusing on the spatial environment and that relationship between materiality uh, and space. Uh, also very important within my research um, was the role of Gussie Spence, whom a lot of people would be familiar with, um, was arrested and imprisoned in 1966. Uh, for uh, a series of murders um, and was in prison until 1985. He was the officer in command, the commanding officer for the UVF in prison when he was in the Crumlin Road Jail um, and then eventually uh, was transferred to the Long Cash compounds as well. So Spence is a huge figure within my thesis, um, within the narratives of my participants. All of them mentioned the influence uh, of Gusty in varying aspects. So to understand really um, my thesis uh, and the prison uh, system, you have to understand kind of where Spence was coming from. Uh, so he had a very um, militarized prison regime that he instituted um, that included weekly military drilling. Um, he ran it, uh, and, and he said this in his um, biography um, by uh, Roy Garland, that he ran it as a barracks. He had a previous uh, British Army military experience that I'll talk about, um, but he wanted to run it in this military style. Uh, but he also included intentionally uh, opportunities for further education, um, teaching classes himself before bringing in open university uh, lectures, um, emphasized physical exercise as well and the importance of physical exercise through running or playing football or what have you. Uh, and also um, a lot of the prisoners would have argued that his uh, influence was behind the handicrafts and the production of artifacts as well, uh, something that skills that he brought with him uh, from the Kremlin Road Jail. So I uh, just wanted to introduce Spence as a character. He'll be referenced throughout my reading um, pretty well. Um, so uh, just to give you, and I apologize, I know some of these uh, images might be difficult to see, uh, an understanding of the compound prison itself. So this is an aerial photograph uh, from 1973, and I've outlined the compound structures uh, because it's important to understand um, that it was an unconventional type uh, of prison uh, system. Uh, so it was built on the former runways you can see here uh, of the Royal Air Force Base um, in Long Kesh. And each compound contained uh, four, these light blue huts here, uh, four huts except for some of these smaller ones, uh, and the dark blue was usually the canteen. So you can see in this image as well, eight, four huts within an individual uh, fence and so each one of those would have been considered a compound. They were designated a number um, by the prison service. So you'll hear me talk, and a lot of people would have probably already heard about Compound 21. It's kind of one of the more famous, uh, the most famous UBF compounds, certainly. Um, and here you can see these Nissen Hut uh, accommodations. This is what they looked like um, after uh, the prison was closed. So this was in 19... Uh, 88, 1989, and the prisoners, the remaining prisoners were transferred um, to a wing of, of the H blocks. 
So this is what the inside would have looked like, and then this is, it's kind of a grainy photograph, uh, what the inside of the hut would have looked like, essentially at the height of the, of the UBF um, presence. Uh, so you can see they built um, makeshift walls, which I'll get into, and then along these walls painted um, murals, which I will be talking about today. So that's the compound prison, but also important for my research um, is understanding uh, kind of a contemporary framing uh, around it, and I'll reference it in this reading, so I wanted to explain it here briefly. Um, I've done a, a number uh, of projects and worked with Action for Community Transformation, which is a non-for-profit um, that works through the processes of, of DDR to help former UBF combatants reintegrate back into society. Uh, and the project has been running since 2008, um, but in 2014, the project director, uh, William Mitchell, uh, told, came to me and told me that he was making a historical exhibition. He wanted my help in, in writing some of the um, text for some of the exhibits that you can't really see here. Um, but it also, uh, he told me he was making uh, a display of the prison handicrafts and artwork. Um, so he uh, brought this in, in in 2014, which is right about when I was starting my fieldwork, and I decided that it would be a really great location to have interviews because it gave me the opportunity, uh, in a sense, kind of a walking methodology. I would take my participants, ask them to walk around the exhibit. They talked about items that they may have donated or made themselves. Uh, and used it um, as a methodological practice. So you'll hear it referenced uh, in my reading, and I wanted to kind of outline uh, and the types of handicrafts as well that were done. So a more personal one here, this was a, um, a dotted uh, pen drawing done of Bob Dylan, who was a favorite of uh, many of the prisoners, and so this was done as a gift from one prisoner to another. But then you have parading materials here as well, and then the more standard leather crafts that a lot of more people would be maybe familiar with um, that was produced uh, kind of en masse as part of a cooperative, which was Spence's doing, um, mass producing items to sell uh, back into the public um, to raise money for prisoner welfare associations that had formed in the early uh, and mid-1970s. So people would have requested items that maybe said long cash or had their name printed on it or uh, various motifs uh, that the prisoners would have made for them. So the prisoners did that on a collective basis um, and also an individual basis to earn money for themselves. So that's all kind of the first uh, three chapters, four chapters of my thesis, um, of the findings of my thesis before getting into uh, the mural. Um, Images. So in this chapter, the first section deals with constructing um, meaning through manipulating the prison spaces. So one of the things that the UVF in particular did, um, and this photograph is an aerial photograph from after 1976. Um, so you can see here the H-block prisons that more people would maybe be familiar with, um, right next to uh, what was left of the compounds at that time. Um, and it's difficult to see, but right here uh, you can see the remaining compounds um, that are not painted over. But these ones here, these three that are all painted black, those were UVF compounds. Um, so you can see here in this blown up image. Uh, so these are compounds uh, 21 here, which was by that time, by 1976, um, the UVF had just taken over compound 21. Uh, 2019. 18 was destroyed by that stage, um, 16 was destroyed, and then 17. So this would have been uh, the area designated for the UVF and the Red Hand Commando. Uh, and one of the things they did was get a lot of black paint from the prison authorities and paint the exterior of the huts uh, it, as a part of this uh, militarized approach to imprisonment so that it looked uh, like a barracks. So I go... Um, and ask the prisoners about painting the exterior of the huts and, and why that was important as a part of the ethos of the prison. Uh, and then uh, the next section deals with decorating the interior spaces. So they would have um, uh, done this uh, on a collective level in terms of getting particle board to build uh, these walls and partitions, 
Um, what I found really interesting was they effectively made themselves cells, if you want to think about it that way. So they, had, but because these spaces meant something different within the context um, of the compounds where they had uh, essentially political status, um, the ability to walk freely among these spaces, uh, they made these rooms as a way to have their own private space uh, within the kind of communal living uh, of the compounds. So they did things, um, you can see uh, the, um, the bars here on the windows, they would have taken off the bars and repainted them when they got a fresh paint in. So instead of just removing the bars, you think about you would remove the bars so that it looks maybe like a normalized, a normal window. Um, they would have had to put them back on or else um, the prison authorities would have intervened, but they would have painted the bars and then put them back on. So the section um, deals with that. Uh, and looks at decorating these interior spaces. So uh, I'm going to just read uh, then for the rest of my presentation, uh, the section on mural painting from my thesis. So I have not done my Viva yet. Um, I, even in reading through this, I was like, ooh, uh, a little rough on the writing. So this is uh, uncritiqued writing uh, aside from my supervisors. So. I uh, hope you'll give me a measure of forgiveness um, if anything doesn't make sense. Uh, so the chapter starts with this quotation here that I'll read through, uh, and it was published uh, in 2014 on an online forum uh, for former combatants of the UVF and the Red Hand called Long Cash Inside Out, um, which was started uh, and launched in 2012 as an opportunity to give prisoners, uh, former combatants, uh, a voice um, so a lot of times you get creative writing pieces, so this was one of the creative writing pieces that was on there. So, uh, today it is raining, the gray ground merges with the gray wire and wall into a gray expanse of cloud. We are in a gray hell. There is no color, only in our huts is there bright colors, our identity. Our resistance to a world devoid of sensation, we have painted our walls ourselves. So that's the title of this chapter, is we have painted our walls ourselves. Within the perpetually gray world of the compounds, opportunities to brighten the visual environment, to add colorful sensations to a world devoid of sensation, very often came in the form of paints, either provided for or stolen by the prisoners. The most impactful usage of these paints was the murals painted on the particle boards which separated individual cubicles. As outlined in chapter three, in each interview with participants, I employed a methodological practice which included showing mural images to the participants in order to elicit a response. The methodology aims to illustrate how images or artifacts can act as repositories for memories and meanings. Belk argued this was an important part of self-identification because, quote, having an extensive or rich sense of the past implies that we are able to clearly define ourselves and ground our identity in previous personal or group history. Participants were able to use the images to recall the meaning of the murals within the social environment of the prison, as well as their own group and individual identifications. The themes of identity, commemoration, and place consider varying various images and ideas that were presented by the UVF Red Hand Commando leadership within the context of mural painting. Similar, similarly to the cooperative artifact production, Mural painting, though an individual activity, was done to help facilitate and maintain a group identity. In this sense, utilizing Morris's notion of the person as a cultural category, which is rooted in the cultural representations of the group, will further illustrate group identity formations within the UVF RHC prisoners. Curious to uncover the reasoning behind the alternative mural images produced in the compounds, I asked each participant where the ideas for the murals came from. Without question, most participants gave a significant portion of the credit to Spence. However, John Craig best summarized the process when I asked him about mural ideas. John stated, Most of them were done under Gusty Spence's leadership and Flint McCullough and Winky Ray. Gusty would have been in charge of the half hut. Gusty would have been in charge of all of the UVF prisoners at that time. And Flint and Winky would have been responsible for what murals they had wanted on the walls in their huts. Executive decisions were taken. In order to draw associations with the first UVF and the First World War, all UVF RHC huts were named after battles in which the 36th Ulster Division received honors. 
Interestingly, the majority of participants did not to re refer to the names of the huts, instead referring to them solely by their location, half, end, and middle, within the compound, as John does above. Flint McCullough and Winky Ray were both members of the RHC, and McCullough was one of its top-ranking officers in the compounds. Each man would have been the officer in command of a particular hut, as Spence would have been the commanding officer for the UVF RHC in all compounds. Loyalist public mural painting in the 1970s and early 1980s focused strongly on the 12th of July commemorations and depictions of broader Protestant and Unionist identities. I forgot to mention that the, the murals in the uh, compounds were painted roughly between 1976 and the early 1980s, as best I can tell. Um, some of them would have maybe uh, predated 1976, depending on which compound they were in. So compound 20 was the remand hut for the UVF um, and so some of the murals in Compound 20 would have been 1974, 1975. But the UVF didn't move into Compound 21 until January of 1976. So every mural uh, in Compound 21 um, uh, goes after that date. Uh, and as best as I can tell, the murals weren't repainted. Um, so I say the early 1980s because one of my participants was one of the mural painters. And he uh, told me that he, you know, after... Uh, pretty much once all the walls were filled up, they just stopped painting new murals. Uh, so in, within public mural painting, they were changing patterns in Loyalist murals during this period, uh, and Rolston claimed that one such trend led to the displacement of the more popular social images uh, relating to the 12th of July in favor of paramilitary emblems as the centerpiece of murals. In terms of identity, this trend was repeated in mural images painted in the compounds, particularly in relation to emblems for the British military, but also for paramilitary groups. Of the 44 compound murals digitally documented, directly 12 directly referenced paramilitary organizations. I will briefly introduce some of the images from this category while addressing the seeming minimization of overtly paramilitaristic and violent images within the prison walls. In the mural catalog produced as a part of the archival research for this dissertation, Subcategories 7, 8, and 9 address paramilitary-related images. Of these 12 murals, four make a direct connection between a paramilitary group and the compound prison. Figure 247, just here. A mural with a green badge and the letters HQ Coy in the center is also framed by two, two scrolls reading Ulster Volunteer Force and Long Kesh Prison Camp. This mural exemplifies Rolston's assessment of large emblems as the centerpiece of 1970s Loyalist murals. This particular mural was painted by Dave Smith, one of my participants, around 1979-1980 in Compound 21. While Dave and I were walking around the ACT exhibition and pointing out various artifacts, I discovered the meaning of HQ Coy within the compound context. William Mitchell, who's ACT's project director, has on display a green banner with the same lettering. So this is uh, in the ACT exhibition. When I asked Dave what the initials stood for, he explained that it stood for Headquarters Company and referenced wherever Gusty Spence was living. So this would have been next to or near Gusty Spence's living quarters uh, within Compound 21. He further explained the coloring of the badge, stating, quote, because of Gusty's serving with the Royal Ulster Rifles, he knew all about the colors and the flashes, the green and black is the colors of the Royal Ulster Rifles. Therefore, even though this mural depicts the paramilitary grouping inside the prison through using the same color scheme as his regiment in the British Army, Spence made a direct correlation to that military history. Connections to the British military and history are expanded on in the section on commemoration. The majority of paramil paramilitaristic compound murals use similar imagery of badges and flags to represent various organizations. Figure 239 includes the UVF and Northern Ireland flag, the badge for the UVF, the Red Hand Commando, and the YCV, all while including a famous portrait of Spence uh, there. Um, with black turtleneck glasses and cap placed above the UVF badge. The other murals in this category follow a similar pattern. Figure 240 uses the same flag motif along with the UVF badge, and the scroll underneath the badge reads Unity, Valor, Fidelity, and makes a direct connection with those values and the UVF. 
There are three murals uh, depicting variations on the badge for the Red Hand Commando, which all would have likely been placed in huts with RHC leadership or members. There is little iconographic difference between the three, particularly figures 242 and 244, as they appear to be slight variation on the same badge. Both figures 243 and 244 were done in compound 20, likely before figure 242, uh, which was done in compound 21. One mural in this category was marked with a specific compound, and apologies, that is the clearest uh, I can get the image, so I'll explain to you what's in there. Um, figure 248 includes the typical iconography of the UVF badge, which is in the center here. Uh, flanked by smaller Red Hand Commando and YCV badges placed above the tattered UVF flag with an illegible scroll on it. I've tried, I can't read what it says on there. It's the best the image that the Northern Ireland Prison Service had. Uh, the banners that surround the UVF badge read Compound 18 and Long Cash, respectively. So, Compound 18 and Long Cash. These murals clearly demonstrate that paramilitary symbols and iconography were relevant within the compound system. Though the murals presented adhere to iconographic and symbolic trends in loyalist murals from the period, they surprisingly do not compromise the majority of the images painted in the prison. One could presume that in a highly politicized cultural and social space, political identities would be emphasized and representations of those identities would dominate. The upcoming sections argue that inside the distinct political space of the prison, images which related to commemorative practices around British military history and depictions of significant places in and around Northern Ireland were valued more than overtly violent or paramilitaristic images. Therefore, the prison mural themes differ from popular perceptions of public, of public UVF Red Hand Commando murals. When Dave Smith and I spoke about the context of the compound murals, I posited that because of this distinct spatial environment, outside of the intensely political and divisive environment of public murals, it was possible that paramilitary murals were not as necessary for maintaining a group identity. Dave considered my contention and replied, If you want to go in terms of psychological concept of identity, we were absolutely assured of our identity in there. We didn't have to tell anybody, we didn't have to flaunt it, show it off. Whereas outside so many murals are territory markers, we didn't need to do that. We had done what we had done and you were carrying on with your life in other ways. But every Monday morning you would have been dressed in the uniform, the black, and out doing your parade. So everybody knew what Compound 21 was. Dave's account demonstrates how the murals functioned for a different purpose and arguably audience within the compounds. They represented different iconographic and thematic trends, trends which were unique to that environment. The narrative also confirms my earlier supposition that the function of the murals is dependent on their context of production. Therefore, it is possible for murals within the semi-private confines of the huts to take on new or alternate meanings. Jarman contends that public murals from either tradition, loyalist or republican, quote, remain a part of two largely separate internal discourses by depicting images and repeating narratives which help reinforce aspects of communal identity constructs. These public murals also serve to notify commun communal outsiders of the spaces and places which belong to one tradition or another. Furthermore, Rolston's writing on public or communal murals within loyalism argue that a shift toward, quote, declarations of territoriality through paramilitary imagery began in the mid-1980s, following the perception within loyalism of the threat posed by the Anglo-Irish Agreement. In contrast to Rolston's assertion, I argue that since UVF RHC compounds were not spatially contested, nor readily accessed by outsiders, there was no need to use the images to demarcate territory in a threatening or intimidating manner. As will be evidenced, the prison murals served a different purpose and had a different audience than the murals outside the prison. This dissertation therefore represents a unique opportunity to discuss and analyze murals produced in an entirely different context. The impact of this different spatial context therefore translated into different images, symbols, and meanings being reproduced on the walls of the huts. Dave's narrative also illustrates how weekly parades served to reinforce UVF RHC embodied ownership of the compound spaces, 
through the ritualistic and repetitive practice of parading. In this sense, though the primary identity formation within the prisons was that of a paramilitary group member and political prisoner, it was not as relevant for the murals to reflect these identities as the murals served a more ordinary and decorative function as opposed to ideological. In the next section, addressing the theme of commemoration, delves further into these complex identity formations and discusses why there is a strong connection between the modern UVF and the British military. As Jarman contended, murals are a, quote, medium in which memories and ideology, the past and the future, can be brought together and provide anchors for the identity of a particular community. A significant portion of the murals produced in the compounds symbolize this anchor through making direct connections between the past and what was at the time, the present. Of the 44 murals documented, 18 murals have been categorized as commemorative. In this category, themes range from the First World War to a memorial for a UVF member who died in the compounds. The identity presented in the commemorative murals relates almost exclusively to an Ulster British military history. The majority of commemorative murals relate to the First World War and reference the experience of divisions of the British Army which were connected to the northern part of Ireland. The modern UVF took its name from an early 20th century counterpoint, counterpoint part which was formed in opposition to the Third Home Rule Bill. Of particular relevance is the formation of the 36th Ulster Division because the ranks of this division were filled with members of the original UVF, including Spence's father, Ned. Subsequently, we find explicit references to the 36th Ulster Division, especially its role at the Battle of the Somme in 1916, embedded in modern UVF commemorative practice. These references function to maintain the legitimacy of the UVF through demonstrating the British military service of its original members. The relevance of 1916 to Irish and Northern Irish commemoration has been analyzed by a wide range of scholars, as we are all aware of this year. <laughs> Uh, moreover, Biner has also argued that, quote, Ireland is deeply troubled by evocative memories of its past, not least of 1916, which inhabits a mythic time and space reverberating with resonances that range far beyond the events of that year. As a result, relevant groups and events from the First World War become a significant part of the narrative to compound murals, broadening understandings of how the memories of the past resonated even in the distinct spaces of the prison. Though the murals overly emphasize this connection, they also reference other British military regiments, events, and connections to Northern Ireland. What is particularly fascinating, especially given the more recent increase in loyalist commemoration of the Somme, is that the battle itself is not specifically referenced by any of the compound murals. Rather, the 36th Ulster Division and other events of the war are more readily depicted. Within the subcategory of First World War military history, there is a mural to, of the Ulster Memorial Tower commemorating the service of the 36th Ulster Division. And it says on the bottom here, in immortal memory of the 36th Ulster Division. Ooh, lost my place. A mural which lists all of, the Victor all of the winners of the Victoria Cross from the 36th. And several murals which depict badges of British military branches. Uh, there were several prisoners in the compounds, a, a lot of the older prisoners, more of Spence's age, who had a, a past in the British military. So uh, participants told me their best guess was that these um, would have been in reference to their military service uh, within those divisions. Since not all 18 murals can be analyzed presently, arguably the most significant and interesting commemorative mural relating to the First World War is examined herein. I argue that it was Spence's interest in military history and especially the First World War which influenced the mural images. It's clear from recollections in Spence's biography that the First World War, its famous battles, and the connection to the original UBF were also important to him. The significance of these connections visually manifested in Spence's influence on the murals. When Spence applied his interest in military history to the production of the murals, images which highlighted service and sacrifice were favored over more traditional and often violent UVF murals. Spence's interest in military history was confirmed by John Craig, who while looking through the mural images recalled, quote, see these particularly military ones, they were more Gusty's inspiration, so that's Gusty's signature in relation to Longkesh. 
Other participants also spoke about the First World War imagery, particularly how it diverged from more violent imagery. In the midst of our conversation about the murals, I asked Dave Smith why Spence was intent on displaying these non-paramilitaristic images. He stated that, quote, there was no need for it because we'd all done what we'd done and we didn't think it was appropriate. Whereas we were commemorating what we believed in and if it was a UVF compound, they harked back to the 36th Ulster Division. Dave elucidates how the practice of commemoration, particularly in relation to the connection of the modern UVF with the 36th Ulster Division, was important within the UVF compounds and huts. Dave argues that because the prisoners had already committed acts of violence for their perceived cause, they did not need to continue to reference, in his words, guys with masks and guns. Effectively, they had taken on a new identification since their imprisonment, and they understood themselves and their larger ideology of the group differently because of this new prison-specific identification. It is also important to note that the murals could function differently and display different aspects of the group identification because they existed outside the public sphere and the ongoing conflict, where perhaps the more violent imagery of the 1980s murals were considered more potent. The connection between these two forces, military and paramilitary, is best exemplified by analyzing the mural of the 36th Ulster Division soldier and a UVF prisoner of war. This particular mural was mentioned by several participants as its theme resonated with their own personal identifications. Rather than describe the mural image myself, I've utilized the description given by former compound commander Billy Hutchinson in the article he wrote for the Prison Arts Foundation called Transcendental Art. Hutchinson argues for the importance of the images to the prisoners' identities in the compounds. He wrote, quote, My favorite was the one inspired by the British anti-war poet Siegfried Sassoon. Suicide in the Trenches, what he called with the name of the poem and what he called uh, the mural, depicts a, a UVF volunteer split down the middle by a bolt of lightning. Half of him depicts the 36th Ulster Division soldier under heavy fire in a rain-soaked World War I trench, the other half shows a 70s volunteer incarcerated behind barbed wire and overshadowed by watchtowers. Hutchinson's writing illustrates the central theme of the mural, the connection, in this sense bodily connection, between the soldier in the First World War and the modern UVF prisoner. Included at the bottom of the mural is an excerpt from the aforementioned poem that reads, You smug-faced crowd with kindling eye who cheer when soldier lads march by. Sneak home and pray you'll never know the hell where youth and laughter go. Quite evidently, the imagery and language reinforce the connection mentioned in Hutchinson's narrative, while also referencing the difficulty faced by soldiers at war. Utilizing imagery and references from the First World War is an important aspect of loyalist symbolism. Within the use of this imagery, there are often connections made to the conflict, Graham and Sherlow contend that the conflict acts as a heritage resource for loyalist identities and claim that, quote, loyalist iconography often links the psalm with the troubles, the defense of small nations, the remembrance of the dead, the return from war. The burgeoning commemorative landscape marking the activities of paramilitary organizations with its gardens of remembrance, war memorials, and murals is a powerful example of the role of symbolic landscapes in constructing these localized expressions of identity. In this sense, the symbolic landscape of the 36th Ulster soldier and the UVF prisoner represent the localized prison identity of the UVF RHC prisoners, while also, in a sense, legitimizing their violence in a broader struggle for queen and country. Within this image, the hell experienced by the split soldier refers to both the horrors of the battlefield and the prison, symbolizing separate spatial environments from ordinary society, where these men experienced violence and loss. In Graham and Sherlow's language, the return from war is absent in this image, instead focusing on the impact of separation from normal society and life. Yet the idea of the return from war is referenced directly in the excerpt from the poem. The poem alludes to the return parade when soldiers come home from war and the reaction of the crowd ignorant to the horrors that the marching lad faced while away. This excerpt, when paired with the mural image, recognizes the sacrifices made through service, either military or paramilitary. Although a multitude of scholars have addressed the Psalms' legacy within loyalism, what the prisoners thought about the image is also quite important. Dave Smith stopped at this mural when he was looking through the images, and his response to the image prompted us to talk about the importance of history within the compounds. 
Dave considered the image and said, I learned that wee phrase off, you smug-faced crowd with kindling eye. That's Siegfried Sassoon, and that has been replicated, or it was, over on the Newtonards Road, this half and half. And I done this quite a few times, you know, the old volunteers and the new volunteers. I like that idea. I done that a few times on paintings and pictures. He stated that it was an image theme that was repeated in public at one time on the Newtonards Road, and also that it was an image which he repeated in his personal handicrafts. Dave wasn't the one who painted this mural, but he did paint a number of others. This excerpt demonstrates how ideas and themes circulated through different contexts through both processes of local relatedness between the original image painted by Freddie Stevenson and the images later painted by Dave Smith, and extra-local relatedness, with the image reappearing in a public context in East Belfast. In this sense, images and symbols moved between prisoners and the outside world through an exchange of ideas and meanings. Utilizing the images and symbols of both conflicts from the battlefields of France to the Nissen huts of the compounds, the mural reinforces the history and identity attached to those associations. As previously mentioned, many scholars argue that the First World War is such a significant event within loyalism because of the connection between the original UBF and sacrifices made by the 36th Ulster Division. This concept of sacrifice is echoed in John Craig's recollection of the same mural. As we were talking through the mural images, he remembered, John shared his thoughts about the Sassoon mural. When I asked him why the reference to the First World War was prominent in compound murals, he stated, It was more about connectivity between the UVF of old and the UVF at present. There was one mural where you would have had split down the middle, and this side of the person who was there was dressed in the old regalia of the UVF. So it was making that connection between the two and the history that was there, and that connectivity actually grew the identity and made it all the more important within regards to the sense of sacrifice by those prisoners to achieve what they were trying to achieve on the outside. Morris's notion of the person as a cultural category, as expressed through ritual context with ideological function, is directly applicable to analyzing this image. These cultural classifications of the person, rooted in ritual and ideology, cannot be separated from the lived experience, quote, for cultural representations are embedded in the practical constitution of everyday life, both social and material. As a result, the cultural category of the person is useful for understanding how group identity is represented within this mural, as the mural image links the social and material aspects of everyday prison life, as well as the social and material aspects of the prisoners themselves. It can be argued that the expression of a UBF identity through mural imagery with a distinct ideological function represents one method of how the cultural category of the UBF RHC prisoner was formed in the prison environment. For John, mural images with this commemorative ritualistic practice reinforced those ideological tenets and solidified feelings of service, sacrifice, and comradeship. As Connerton asserted, commemorative rites are repetitive in order to maintain both continuity with the past and to remind the group involved of, quote, its identity as represented by and told in a master narrative. Therefore, the extent to which the narratives of the First World War were incorporated into the master narratives of the UVF in prison is made quite clear through both embodied and material incarnations. The UVF prisoners were assured of their prison-specific place identities through their engagement with the material culture and the ritualistic practices of Spence's regime, all while maintaining a continuity with the past actions of the original UVF stroke 36 Ulster Division. These place identities were shaped by the distinct spatial environments of the compounds. Spatial contexts are extremely important to understanding the function of murals within the compound huts. I already argued that awareness of the physical and social context of the murals is essential to deriving their meaning and symbolism. Furthermore, Graham and Sherlow contend that the Battle of the Somme, and by association, other battles of the First World War, have, quote, become a part of the process through which a fusion of real and imaginary space is being used to impose an identity and therefore social control. Hence, the imagined spaces of the battlefields are reproduced and emphasized in the real spaces of the compound huts, imposing the identity of Spence's regime, as well as facilitating both his spatial and social control of the environment. Though the commemorative murals serve this ideological function, the final section on murals in this chapter 
addresses other elements of identity formation and their connection to placemaking, both inside and outside the prison. Analyzing the places depicted in the murals exposes processes of local and extra-local relatedness within the permanent imagery of the compound murals. The subsequent section consequently argues that the place-themed murals function differently from the ideologically-themed images, further demonstrating how artifacts can gain new meaning and impact when appropriated in new social, spatial, and historical settings. The representation of place in the compound murals is a fascinating demonstration of the different possible meanings and functions of murals, especially when situated outside of their perceived normal context of gabled walls in local estates. Of the 44 documented murals, 18 of them are considered related to place and are listed in subcategories dealing with local, cultural, and political history. Within the local history subcategory, murals depict local places, some with labels and some without, including Carrick Fergus Castle, thatched, old thatched cottages in Waringstown, Flemish Mountain, uh, and the coast road near an unknown glen, and it's just because it's obscured uh, down there, so you guys can guess which glen it is, or if somebody could tell me, that would be nice. Um, the specific glen referenced is, is no longer le- legible. The subcategory of cultural stroke local history includes images relating to cultural and social actions in an Irish context. These four murals depict a farmer thrashing oats with flails, a peat farmer, an old woman spinning yarn. Uh, I have a picture of this um, once it was removed from the prison and there was a, a, a context added to the bottom that said old woman spinning yarn in uh, Waringstown 1914. Um, so that was added uh, presumably after this. And a busy street scene Uh, outside Belfast City Hall. We're not that busy as we would now know it. Lastly, the subcategory of political stroke local history includes more traditional themed murals depicting uh, the Belfast City coat of arms and the emblem of Northern Ireland, as well as a map of Northern Ireland, a mural dedicated to Edward Carson, and an image commemorating the original UVF. to September 1914 uh, on the quote from Edward Carson there. A few of these images are directly relatable to traditional understandings of loyalist murals, especially those considered relevant by leading mural scholars. Why then were these images incorporated into the compound prison environment? While John Craig and I looked through the mural images while sitting adjacent to the ACT exhibition, he spoke at length about their meaning and significance to the prisoners. John recognized that not all prisoners appreciated the murals. As the prisoners adjusted to their new spaces and routines within the compounds, he contended that, quote, you know they, the murals, were there, and then after a while they weren't there. They were an invisible type of thing. They were just part of the scenery. This highlights how, though some prisoners would have felt the murals were important, for many of them, the murals became subsumed into the everyday visual environment of the prison. Though they would have brightened up this visual environment through the use of color, It is possible that the individual murals, particularly those associated with places outside the prison, did not have as much of an impact as the more politicized mural images. Uh, Almost every uh, participant that I interviewed when we talked about murals prior to me showing them the images referenced the Sassoon mural of the split soldier. Um, And some of them would have mentioned these cultural uh, and historical ones as well, but that was without question the most often remembered uh, mural image. I will now briefly explore uh, one place-themed mural before finishing the chapter with an in-depth exploration um, of the most significant place mural. Participants also revealed how some of the place-themed murals were indicative of the area, the the geographical area outside of the prison, where groups of prisoners were from, further demonstrating both local and extra-local relatedness within the huts. While Dave Smith looked through the mural images, he attempted to remember the location of each mural uh, the location within the compounds, uh, and whether, as well as any other details he could recall. When he saw the mural depicting Carrick Fergus Castle, he recalled several relevant points in relation to the use of place in the compound murals. Dave responded to the image, stating, quote, 
I would say that was Messines, so the Messines hut. That is the end hut. And I'll tell you why, just in terms of a lot of the Carrick men moved up into the end hut. Again, that thing about sticking together. And we thought that's very appropriate, that Carrick Fergus castle, because quite a lot of them were from Carrick Fergus, home away from home for them. This excerpt demonstrates local relatedness through how the prisoners influenced their living arrangements when possible and how other prisoners were aware of the different groupings uh, based on both their place of origin, uh, geographical place of origin, and the murals on the wall. Uh, several other participants would have said to me, um, oh, so-and-so lived next to this mural, or this mural was outside. So they were even used as like a, a way to identify parts of, of the huts. Um, uh, and, oh, my, my friend lived behind this mural, and that was kind of the ones that they might have remembered more than others. Uh, additionally, Dave's comments on the men from Carrick Fergus shows how prisoners used the mural images to maintain a connection to relevant places outside the prison. In his writing on how prisoners of war from the First World War maintained connections to home through material culture, Becker contends that prisoners were located in a space that was elsewhere, as POW camps were in between the structured spaces of the battlefields and the home front. Faced with this removal from the structured spaces of conflict, Becker argued that prisoners used material culture, in his instance um, through the practice of letter writing, to survive their detention. Becker's analysis is most useful for understanding how the murals functioned to strengthen patterns of extra-local relatedness. He argued, through the act of material culture, there is, quote, the connection of action and object and the maintenance of various senses of belonging to family, friends, community, and the outside world. For the compound murals, such as Carrick Fergus, the image represented a portal, a visual reminder of the world outside, a world filled with color and images which referenced that idea of belonging to a group and a place outside the prison. The idea of still being connected to and belonging to the outside world when faced with a prolonged deprivation of liberty and access to those people and places is perhaps demonstrated most successfully in the mural depicting Ardglass Harbor. When I first gained access to the mural images through my work with the Northern Ireland Prison Service Archive, I was surprised to encounter a high number of murals which diverged from the more traditional themes in Loyalist and UBF murals. Since the murals in the compound have never before been analyzed, the only source on mural themes and symbols dealt with them in a public context. At one point during our conversation, Dave Smith and I came across a mural which had a physical and emotional impact on him. When Dave looked at the image of Ardglass Harbor, he was shocked to remember that it was a mural he had painted in Compound 21. The image depicts a harbor scene of the county downtown of Ardglass and includes a banner which reads, Ardglass County Down, Center of the Ulster Herring Industry. For rather obvious reasons, this inscription exemplified the different theme and function of some of the place-related murals, and therefore it was one which I utilized as an example with my participants to get them to consider the meaning of these non-politicized murals. When Dave saw the mural, presumably for the first time since he had been released from prison, he exclaimed, Whoa, right, totally forgot about this one. This is one of mine. That is one of mine. That is amazing. I can even tell you the book I took it out of. That is really incredible. Our glass, again it would be cultural, nothing to do with the troubles, the county down shield, and I'd done quite a few of them, the Ulster Badge, Center of the Herring Industry. It was a large book of colored photographs of the British Isles, Scotland, England, and Wales, but in Northern Ireland, quite a lot of very vivid, bright, colorful, nearly like tourist promotional photographs. I have absolutely no idea why this was picked, but again, I was asked to do it, and I gotta say, I think it's one of my better ones. Again, it took a lot of time working from the back outwards. You can see the beige cream surround, and that was what hut? It was definitely 21, but what hut? I just totally forgot all about that. That is incredible. That's amazing. As is rather evident from the number of exclamations uh, in the excerpt, Dave was quite shocked to encounter an image for a mural he had forgotten he painted. It was an important moment for me as well, witnessing the evident shock and surprise Dave felt at seeing the mural. I remember at the time thinking that this was a rather significant for Dave, moment for Dave personally, one which emphasized the inherent human connection between object, memory, and meaning. Belk introduces the concept of nostalgia in regards to possessions and argues that a characteristic of nostalgia 
is that it involves an emotional rather than a cognitive memory process. As a result, he argues that objects of nostalgia produce richer narratives because rather than serving as, quote, simple cues to propositional memories involving knowledge that something occurred, these objects provoke rich textual memories involving knowledge of the experience recalled. In relation to Dave's narrative, evident in his response is a high level of nostalgia for the artifact in question. This particular narrative reveals how nostalgic and emotional recollections of a specific object include the memory of making and engaging with the object, thus creating a stronger bond between self, object, past, and memory. In Dave's excerpt, we can see how he produced a richer, emotive memory, one which supports Belk's notion that these memories reflect knowledge of the experience recalled. Dave did not simply remember that he painted the mural, but he recalled the experience of painting it through describing where he got the image and how he felt about painting it over 30 years ago. Dave was always very self-critical about any of the work that he would talk about, and he would say, like, oh, that wasn't a very good one, and, or, I, you know, I quite like the design that I came up with in that one, so he kind of included that in his critiques. Uh, he also recalled that he could not remember why he was asked to paint that particular image, though in actual fact, why he painted this mural is not as important as what the mural possibly symbolized to the prisoners. Perhaps the motivation for the place-themed murals was to include scenes from the outside world and to exclude references to the reason for their imprisonment, the ongoing violence and conflict. As Dave mentioned earlier, we had done what we had done and you were carrying on with your life in other ways. Therefore, it is possible that compound leaders such as Spence would have used the free spaces on the hut walls to depict pleasant imagery full of colors and references to the world outside the gray expanse of the compounds. In this sense, the murals serve a psychological function similar to the ideological function outlined in the discussion of commemoration. Again, through repetition, by incorporating images of various places around Northern Ireland, the murals acted as visual reminders of the social and cultural world outside prison, paramilitarism, and the UVF. In the context of our first interview, John Craig mentioned the wide range of artifacts produced in the prison, including murals. Though I did not have the murals images with me at this meeting, we continue to talk about the importance of them. Airing some of my own frustrations, I referenced the painting of Our Glass Harbor and confessed that I was having difficulties understanding why images such as Our Glass were popular within the prison murals. In his response, Dave easily identified and articulated why these images would have been valuable and important to the social world of the compounds. John thought about images like Our Glass and stated, as a prisoner, I can understand that one, and that was idyllic type of outside coming inside to brighten up the life inside. You know, we couldn't go to Ardglass Harbor to look at Ardglass Harbor, but we could look at the painting that Freddie had done of Ardglass Harbor, and we could almost imagine ourselves there. You know, even walking past it and looking at it, that's a different place from where we're fucking in. You know what I mean? I think we would connect with more with it that way. Through John's statement, the purpose of these idyllic outdoor scenes is revealed in its simplest form. The place theme murals helps to facilitate and maintain place identities associated with the spaces outside the prison walls, reminding prisoners of the rest of society while they were held in the elsewhere space of the prison. Though this dissertation has presented numerous examples of the benefits of the compound environment and special category status, from high levels of autonomy to access to education and handicraft implements, the essential truth of these prisoners' experience is that they were prevented from accessing any place outside the compounds. In conclusion, murals such as Arglass Harbor or Slemish Mountain allowed the prisoners to imagine or envision a place different from the everyday lived spaces of the compounds. Throughout my interviews, participants recalled how the monotony and unchanging circumstances of the prison environment had the potential to negatively impact their psychological health. The bright colors and vivid images of the postcard scenes on the hut walls provided a visual mechanism to resist those negative emotions or inclinations simply by giving the prisoners something positive and engaging to look at. Whether all the prisoners benefited from these images or noticed them at all as their sentence progressed, I have shown how they served a very different function to murals produced in public spaces. The prison murals depicting places all around Northern Ireland contributed to the patterns of extra-local relatedness by allowing prisoners to maintain connections to the outside world through visual images, therefore facilitating processes of placemaking both inside and outside the prison walls. 
Engaging with material culture and architecture helped the prisoners present aspects of their multivocal identities, while also allowing them to control the spaces and places of the prison. Moreover, analyzing the various themes found in the murals illustrated how the political act of transforming the prison space also enforced important ideological tenets, as well as patterns of placemaking. The murals in the compound huts served to highlight important concepts of a UVF RHC identity, such as politics, commemoration, and military service, while also highlighting how they were used to maintain the psychological health of the prisoners.